Um, again, it's a big topic, so if I am going on, please stop me. Okay, so uh, I don't Maybe want to too much. Um, I've done this in two parts, really, because I was asked to talk about the multidisciplinary team management, uh, but also I've put some basic stuff in here about the uh, management of diabetic feet. So what is the scope of the problem? It's huge. You don't need me to tell you that. We're seeing more and more diabetics, and they're getting more and more problem with their feet. 50% of major amputations are in diabetics, and if they have an amputation on one side, there's a two-thirds chance that they'll have the other leg off within five years. So if you can avoid amputation, that's much better. This is our national body, National Institute of Clinical Excellence. Um, some people would say it's a National Institute of Cancelling Everything because they, uh, they never approve anything new. But they have advised a multidisciplinary approach, and it should comprise of a diabetes consultant, an orthopaedic surgeon, diabetes specialist nurse, podiatrist and a tissue viability nurse with access to other experts as necessary. It's a very busy slide. The important thing is of the 10 objectives that they mention, only three of them are to do with the orthopaedic surgeon. All right? So this is very much a team approach rather than you as a surgeon acting in isolation. In Leicester, we've had a multidisciplinary team for a long time. Um, I'm the orthopaedic surgeon involved. We have a diabetic consultant in clinic with me, a medical microbiology consultant in clinic with me as well, which I find very useful, a podiatrist, a diabetes nurse special, uh, specialist, an ortho, a thought, orthotic technician, and a plaster technician. So this is the team. This must be a good day because they're all smiling. Uh, but you can see there's a lot of people in a small room and there's the patient behind them, patients obscured by the number of people that are in there. So that's very labor intensive, but it's a fantastic venue and it's a fantastic experience for the patient. Does it work? Well, here's some of the bodies that recommend an MDT approach. So you've got Diabetes UK, Nice UK, you've got the American organizations, and these are organizations that wouldn't recommend something if it didn't work and if it wasn't value for money. All right? What are the advantages? Well, I think if you look at it from the patient perspective, number one is they get to see lots of different people in one place. So that means less time off work for them. It means they're not having to pay to come to and from hospital to see multiple people at multiple different times. They like it they're much more likely to attend when they're seeing three or four people than they are to see one person. They also spend a lot less time in limbo. What do I mean by that? Well, if I refer somebody to orthotics, they are seen there and then in the clinic by the orthotist. They're not waiting, waiting 10 weeks to see them. And they get a consistent message. You've got everybody banging on, saying the same thing to them, look after your feet, do this, do that. And they like getting a consistent message from health professionals. Why do I like the MDT? Well, I like it because when I'm presented with something like this in clinic, I can go and talk to my plaster tech and I can say, look, can you fashion me something here that will help me control the position of this guy's foot and I can tell them what I'm trying to achieve. The liaison nurse can be going and organizing their admission and talking to the uh, ward staff and everything else. The microbiologist comes along, looks at the previous cultures, they recommend the antibiotics, they prescribe the antibiotics, and the diabetes consultant comes in and sorts out their blood sugars. So life is so much easier for me. I'm not spending two hours on the phone trying to sort out one patient. There are disadvantages, okay? There's no doubt that these are expensive to set up, okay? Uh, you've got a lot of different um, technicians involved, you've got a lot of paramedics, and you've got a lot of medics involved. There are a lot of costs setting it up. But overall, the costs are less. These are all people that are employed anyway. It's just getting them into the one place that's difficult. It is labor intensive, lots of different professionals. You also make a rod for your own back. Once you set up an MDT, people start to refer in. And if you can advertise that there's an MDT locally, you will get the referrals, believe me. But you do need a large footprint to accommodate all of these people. Your plaster tech needs a room, your orthotist needs a room, etc., etc. What are you interested in as surgeons? Well, does it work from the point of view of, does it reduce your complication rate? Well, here we go. There's lots of evidence out there. Two thirds reduction in amputations within two years in a center in UK. That was in Middlesbrough. 40% uh, reduction in amputations in America. 50, 
to 70% reduction of amputations in Spain. So yes, it does work. And actually, I even found a couple of papers from Chennai and India here recommending the MDT approach. All right, so your local guys are telling you this is a good thing also. Your hospitals want to know, does it work from the financial perspective? Well, here's just one study from the UK. Uh, they reduced their amputation rate by two thirds, okay? in two years. It cost them £33,000 to get everybody involved and run it over a year. They saved a quarter of a million in the first year. Okay? It's not just the hospitals that benefit, it's the patients as well. If you use a measure of how much money the patients save over the course of a year, uh, this is the five-year savings of a one-year cohort of patients, and they saved in, times of, in terms of you know, being able to get back to work, etc. They saved £151,000. So the patients benefit, the hospitals benefit, and the surgeons benefit. Okay, so that's enough about the MDTs. I think I've banged home the point um, uh, enough there. As a surgeon, what is your role? Okay, and a lot of the times you get involved with the diabetic feet, you're firefighting. Okay, so you get involved with ulcer care. There are some basic principles, all right? First of all, in red at the bottom there, you see vascular assessment. It is surprising how often the basics are missed. If they haven't got a blood supply, no matter what you do, it's not gonna work, okay? So make sure they have an adequate blood supply before you start doing anything. In general, if there's infection there, you need to make a wide exposure to get rid of it. Don't think you'll get away with leaving any osteomyelitis. You won't, all right? Osteomyelitis needs surgical resection. And if you're taking bone out, send it to the labs, all right? Find out what the organism is. And again, necrotic tissue with exposure of bone and joint and tendon, that's not gonna heal. And a vac, you stick a vac on it, that's not gonna heal, it needs surgery. This is something that we've started using quite a lot in uh, Leicester, and I've been very impressed with it. There won't be much data out there in the literature, but this is something called Stimulan Rapid Cure. Now, um, it is a pure manufactured calcium sulfate, so it's an artificial bone graft, but it's manufactured so it's got no impurities in it. This is not like the stuff we used to get, which was dug out of the ground. Okay, this stuff leaves no residue behind, no foreign bodies behind to cause reinfection. It's resorbed within three or four weeks completely, so you don't need to take it out again like you do with PMAA. It also elutes 100% of the antibiotics that you put into it, which you only get about 8% elution from um, uh, PMMA. It provides 50 times the minimum inhibitory concentration of the antibiotic locally, and you do not get systemic, um, any systemic uh, measurable levels of the antibiotic. So again, you don't need to take this stuff out. It dissolves away. And you can mix in whatever antibiotic you want, as opposed to PMMA, which you can only get with gentamicin. Here's a diabetic heel ulcer. He also had a fracture, as you can see in the bottom picture there. Now, previously, this would have been a very high uh, risk of amputation. Um, using the rapid cure, I can mix it with whatever antibiotic I want. I can mix it with liquid antibiotics, which, again, you can't do with uh, PMMA, uh, with the bone cement. And you can mix up to 40% of the volume with this. It'll still set. If you mix up 40% of the volume with, um, with the uh, bone cement, it will never set. So here I've stabilized that fracture using an external fixator, and you can see the beads of the stimulan in there. About 10 weeks later, I removed the external fixator. You can see the stimulan's disappeared completely. It's done its job. It's eradicated the infection. We knew what organism uh, was in there. We specifically tailored the antibiotics to it, and this healed up, his ulcer healed up within about 10 weeks, okay? So I have been very impressed with this product. I have no uh, affiliation to this company at all. It is just something that I use. There will be other similar products on the market there, but you must make sure it's pure and it's manufactured. Okay, VAC therapy, I use this quite a lot. It's a negative pressure wound dressing. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It encourages the wound to heal in uh, because it actually physically draws the wound edges in and it reduces the bacterial load by a thousand times by day four. Okay, does it work? 
Well, again, yes, it does. Uh, there's a financial benefit to it, but it is not a substitute for an adequate debridement. You have to adequately debride these legs uh, or these feet. So what are your goals of surgery as a surgeon? Um, first of all, control of infection. Well, I've talked about that. Um, we also need to relieve or redistribute pressure. Um, okay, again, if you're getting ulcers and recurrent ulcers, then they've got a pressure problem. You need to do something with that. We sometimes need to restore uh, stability or alignment, and we're trying to prevent amputation. What are your indications for surgery? Well, again, if they've got an ulcer, or if they're getting a recurrent ulcer, then you have to relieve the pressure. Unstable or unbraceable joints means that whatever you do, uh, that ulcer is going to recur. And obviously, if there's any active infection or if there's an Achilles tendon contracture, then you need to address that. What can we do? Well, the simplest and easiest is the exostectomy, and that's just basically a bumpectomy. Obviously, if there's an Achilles tendon contracture, you want to uh, relieve that and uh, lengthen the Achilles tendon. And then realignment, but sometimes amputation, is the only reasonable option. So here's an exostectomy. You can see, obviously, a plantar ulcer. And this is a very effective, simple, straightforward procedure. Okay? I would say that it is important that you do this in a stable foot. So in this foot, actually, he's got quite good midfoot stability. If you've got a foot that is just unstable in the midfoot, if you do an exostectomy, it is only going to recur. Okay? So this will only work in your residual charcot, in your stage three healed charcot. What about realignment arthrodesis? Uh, well, again, if you've got something like this, where you've got essentially a flail foot underneath the tibia, that's never going to heal. And that's unbraceable, it's too unstable, it's not going to work. So in this particular case, what we try to do is put the foot back underneath the tibia. We're not looking for perfection here. We're not looking for successful fusions necessarily. It doesn't matter if it fuses or not, as long as the foot is underneath the leg. You can use internal fixation. I, these days I would use a hind foot nail to give rigid internal fixation. But again, you've got a braceable foot. Here's the midfoot that I was talking about that collapses, that continues to collapse, and a failed exostectomy here because they didn't appreciate the problem. What we have to do here is the superconstruct. Okay, what is the superconstruct? Well, this is using long screws front to back through the metatarsals into the hind foot, and you have to correct the deformity. All right, so again, it's aggressive internal fixation so that they can walk on it and it's not going to fail. Again, you've seen this extra, oh, you've seen this clinical photograph before. This is difficult surgery. You do get wound healing problems. There is a risk of infection. There is a risk of amputation. And you have to counsel your patients about this. But these are patients that are going to have these problems if you don't operate. So yes, it's risky surgery, but it can be very rewarding. But you've got to pick your patients. Is it worth it? It's technically demanding, there are high complications, you've got to immobilize them for longer, but the function is much better than an amputation. And there is data out there to say the higher the level of the amputation, the less long the patients live. Okay? So it saves limbs, it saves lives. So in other words, yes, it is worth it. So I think we are getting better treatments, we are getting better at it, but the team approach is the key to managing these problems. Thanks.